So, Jamil, we're here in your old stomping grounds, your old high school, Mumford High School, and how fitting um, that when you grace these halls, you knew you wanted to be a sports journalist. And there are a lot of people who helped to helped you to get there. Talk a little bit about how you got to the free press and your internships and the things that happened at Mumford High School. Well, in Mumford was where that sort of uh, passion for journalism started. I wrote for the Mumford Times, a high school newspaper, because I took a journalism class and that's what you did. And it wound up, you know, intersecting with what was a very monumental summer for me. I applied for an apprenticeship program at the Detroit Free Press, was able to get that. And then that same summer, the National Association of Black Journalists, their annual convention was in Detroit. And the woman, Dr. Louise, Louise Reed Ritchie, who ran the program, uh, the apprenticeship program, she marched us down to NABJ and she made us go up and introduce ourselves to recruiters and editors and other black journalists and say, you know, hi, my name is Jamel Hill. I'm an 11th grader at Mumford High School and here's my resume. Yeah. So all of that, uh, you know, Mumford was kind of the, um, the genesis of like so many things that uh, sprung that sprung up in my career. Yeah, yeah. You talked about how this teacher or the, the woman that's over this program, she she kind of whipped you guys <laughs> in, into shape and, and how, you know, being from Detroit, people expected you to fail because you're from Detroit. Um, but that that also helped to shape who you were. Talk about that. Yeah, I, my relationship with this city is, is just very special. Uh, I think most Detroiters that grow up here, we know that there's a certain perception of our city and therefore there's a certain perception of who comes from the city. And I, I think some of that has changed, but when I was growing up, the only time you ever saw Detroit on the national news was for, it was when the murder rate was released because mm -hmm. we were usually in the top five or if not number one and for Devil's Night. And that was pretty much it. And because people often made Detroit the butt of so many jokes, it ingrains a chip on your shoulder and that's how the people feel here it's like we know that we are not a city defined by the worst of us or our worst problems the problems that are in detroit are in pretty much every Oops. major city mm -hmm. but we just don't have the cool pr being known as the cool city you know la has the same problems that detroit has so does chicago so does new york but because we're not a travel uh, a instant travel destination people tend to hate on this city and feel like people from this city don't deserve to have good things. So as I progressed in my career, I wanted to make it known where I was from and how much what I learned here and what was instilled in me here carried on and carried me upward throughout my mm -hmm. career. So it was always important for me to talk about Detroit, to talk about Mumford, to let people know Mumford is a real school. I know y'all saw Axel Foley with the t-shirt, yes, right, but right. this school <laughs> actually real. exists because Jerry Bruckenheimer, the, the famous director and producer, went to Mumford. Mm -hmm. So it, I thought it was important that people nationally and even in the city understand that legacy about the Mumford High School. Love it, love it, love it. Um, so why, why did you write a book and why now? I didn't choose the memoir, the memoir chose me. <laughs> um, I, look, my literary agent was very real with me and said there's a lot of interest in people wanting to hear your story, which was, and this will probably sound weird to people, which was kind of surprising to me. I know people understood I was a public figure and people tend to have a curiosity about that, but that doesn't mean they want to hear about you and your life for 250, 300 pages. And once we saw there was a considerable amount of interest in it, I just I decided to go with it. I said, okay, this is where we are. I have to write this memoir. I always saw myself as an author, but I want to write fiction. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, the memoir is a good starting place. And I decided, okay, if I do this memoir, or I am doing this memoir, rather, then the only way I know how to do it that would be up to my standard is if I were as honest and transparent with people as possible. And you really are honest and transparent, <laughs> so much so. But I, I can identify with so much of your growing up and, and uh, having a mother that um, substance abuse. Um, but you talk so candidly about that. I feel like when I talk to young people about my father being an alcoholic, he has passed on and he's no longer here. I can't imagine saying some of the things that I say to people and he's still alive. Your mom is still with us. You talked about her substance abuse, you talk about the men she slept with, you talk about a lot of things that I would imagine would embarrass her. What does she think about it? Well, like? my, my mother knew um, everything I was writing and I 
interviewed her, ex excuse me, I interviewed her extensively for this book. It, my mother is not ashamed of her story because she's come out of that and has been out of it for so long. She has her own. Does she still live here? She does. She lives in Novi. Oh, wow. yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. She lives in Novi. My father still uh, lives in Detroit. So she has her own personal, powerful testimony. And our stories are intertwined. The things that I saw her do, uh, the things that she experienced, the traumas, those were all things I had to live through too. Mm -hmm. And there was no way to separate the stories. And um, I guess it's the journalist in me, even if she didn't like it, I mean, it's a part of my story. Yeah. And it's the truth. And like you said, when you wanted to do this, you knew you had to bring it. You had to be truthful. Yeah, because a lot of people read um, memoirs by, you know, notable people, by public figures, by celebrities, and they read them and feel like they didn't learn everything or that they held back a little bit mm -hmm. or that they mm -hmm. maybe were trying to shape the narrative more about them looking good and favorable. I didn't want to do that. I mean, I'm glad that I'm writing this as a professional journalist. I wanted to hold myself to the same standard that I hold the subject that I sit down with. So the only way I knew how to do this in a way that I felt like I could be proud of is if I did it very, very honestly, even if it forced me to relive some painful me memories and painful experiences, I think it was worth it because of what came alive on the pages. Yeah, painful. I mean, you, t you talked about you know your experience of almost being raped by a family member nonetheless. Or a friend of a, Fr friend friend of a family, okay. sort of, yeah. Kind of, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. um, and then how you fought your way out of that, and I thought that was um, interesting because you have had to f kind of fight your way out of situations just all your life. Um, you know, when you went to Michigan State, you wrote for the newspaper there, and you had kind of some controversial statements. Can you talk a little bit about that, <laughs> uh, your time at Michigan State? Well, I, I know a, a lot of people have asked me, I get asked very often about, like, how did you develop your voice, and how, how, do, how are you so strong and re resilient? And it's really through lived experience, yeah. right? Yeah. It's like, I, I got put into a boot camp I didn't even know was happening, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I think because of that, it allows me to have an amazing amount of perspective, both in my writing and in my life. Uh, whenever I face controversy or difficult moments, I think about what I've come out of, and it makes those moments seem a little less difficult, a little more uh, easier to bear. And, you know, I don't know, I can't say if that's healthy or not, but I, I do think that it allows me to navigate um, the problems in my life just very, very differently. Mm -hmm. and even when the, the controversy happened with the president, the reason why... Um, I think I was able to handle what he said about me is because I'm like in the whole uh, gamut of my life, the president saying that about me and the White House saying that I should be fired wouldn't even rank in the top 20 of worst things I've experienced. I mean, it just wouldn't, yeah. right? And so um, I don't and know. And you're from Detroit. Too. And that's, I'm from here. Like, right. Yeah, from I mean, Detroit. this is, but going through those tough experiences is what allowed me to just be able to stand in a truth, mm -hmm. right? It's mm -hmm. like, that's why I'm able to defend what I say. And, um, you know, when I am facing criticism, I'm able to weather that because yeah. it's like, this is really not the worst, worst thing you've ever been that I've ever right, been through. Right, 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 right. Uh, and I love what you say, because my grandma used to say something similar to me, the Lord didn't bring you this far to, to leave, leave you. you. Yeah, right. yeah. Um, but you mentioned Donald Trump. Uh, for people that don't know, um, you made a tweet a calling, I'm paraphrasing something like um, Donald Trump, you called him a white supremacist, mm -hmm. and, and he responded. He didn't say your name. Right. Not at first. Not at first, <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and all of a sudden, I mean, we've always known you, Detroiters, and know who you are and love you, but the whole world, I mean, that just really took off. Um, and, and just, just kind of explain what happened for people uh, at home who maybe don't know that, you know, what, what that was all about. So back in 2017, uh, we're about a month out of what happened in Charlottesville, which mm -hmm. was a very pivotal moment to me and for a lot of people in this country where you saw neo-Nazis basically take over an American city. And it was one of the most alarming things that I've ever seen. You know, I didn't live through the civil rights era, so uh, I, I didn't know what that was like to see that. And seeing that kind of ugliness, like really not just disappointed me and was heartbreaking, it also angered me. So one day I'm on Twitter and there was somebody trying to just adamantly defend Donald Trump. And that's when I just tweeted to this person, like, 
hey, we have a full on white supremacist in office who has surrounded himself with other white supremacists. This is the moment that we're in in this country and we need to be to be honest about that. When I tweeted that, I never expected this would reach the levels of the White House. She was asked about my tweets, and she said that it was a fireable offense. Mm -hmm. And Donald Trump demanded an apology. He didn't mention me by name in his original tweet, but then when I later got suspended, he blamed me for ESPN's ratings mm -hmm. um, tanking. And so I, I never did I expect that tweeting something that was true would reach the, the level of the White House to the point where you have the most powerful person in the world saying that, you know, you don't deserve your job. It's the very essence of why we need a free press, because the government is not uh, supposed to be able to attack citizens. Mm -hmm. Like, we're supposed to be able to criticize our government free of persecution. That is exactly what... The reason... The, that is what the First it's Amendment the means. Exactly. It's in the Constitution, all right? Mm -hmm. So I was um, not only disappointed that, that he would use such an enormous platform and pulpit that he has to... Uh, attack me, but very disappointed in ESPN for not responding in defense of me mm -hmm, as well. Mm -hmm. And that that was a that wasn't the only thing that uh, happened at ESPN, and you talk in depth about that in the book. Um, and we don't have to go into that. I want to just kind of stay with Detroit and um, Mumford and MSU. Um, so you go from doing an internship at uh, the Detroit Free P Press when you were. A Senior, a junior, junior in high school, yeah, an apprenticeship. Yeah, okay, apprenticeship, mm -hmm. and then from there, uh, you go to Michigan State. Mm -hmm. You work for the newspaper there, mm -hmm. and you have all kind of experiences. You talk about, you know, um, being around white people you never <laughs> thought about, you know, when you got your roommate That's assignment. A, uh, talk about know. that, like at Michigan State. You, well, yeah. Michigan State was a really big culture shock for me. I mean, coming from Detroit, this city is 80, 85 percent black, right? Going to high school, we had one black kid at my, one, 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 white one white kid at Mufford the whole time they I was there. They picked on him and everything. Yeah, yeah they the picked whole on him and everything. So, you know, you're used to being in a, a very tight black enclave mm -hmm. um, you know you go to whatever you do you go to movies go to the store is black people everywhere now, I knew Michigan State had white people but when I got there I was like oh they got a lot of white people 40,000 students plus and you're a real minority there mm -hmm. and it was very much a culture shock for me and so I had uh, a couple of white sweet mates you know, from Sterling Heights and you know, there's a lot of cultural differences between the two, between all of us, but we were able to learn a lot about each other. Mm -hmm. And it was a very um, kind of monumental, life-changing experience. Also, it was the first time I really encountered racism yeah. was at Michigan State because it's a mixed environment. Right. And uh, you know, it, it is where racially I saw a lot of dynamics, a lot of hierarchies understood the how racism is institutional and of course in my coursework being able to learn so much more about the structures in this country period and so there it's why I, I put in my social media bio that Michigan State is where I grew up mm -hmm. and I was born and raised in Detroit obviously but Michigan State is where real growth process happened for me. It was the first time you were called the n-word. It was it was at Michigan State mm -hmm. and what was what's been interesting is in, in talking to a lot of black alumni that went to Michigan State a lot of us have the same, same. story. It's like mm -hmm. that was the first place that we were called that or experienced some very overt racism. And so it was very eye opening for me. And unfortunately, uh, you know, being uh, being criticized, you know, with racial slurs and that kind of stuff, that was the onset of that in my journalism career. And unfortunately, it prepared me for what I would face throughout my career, mm -hmm. being called these names and um, you know, really angering people to the point where they felt that kind of disrespect was was necessary or even uh, permissible. And so, uh, unfortunately, it's where I first learned to really deal with hate mail and backlash. Right, right. And you would do that for <laughs> a very long, even <laughs> up until now, right? Okay, so you leave Michigan State and then you get another internship in Raleigh or, or Philadelphia. Raleigh. Oh, I know. I, I had. I was the forever <laughs> intern. Okay, <laughs> like the entire time in college, because I've been told that you have to have experience mm -hmm. in this business mm -hmm. and you need internships. So I interned uh, in Lima, Ohio, uh, at the Free Press, the Philadelphia Inquirer, the Plain Dealer in Cleveland, and uh, the News and Observer in Raleigh. And Raleigh hired me right out of that internship because you had, and that's a, a pretty medium-sized mm -hmm. newspaper it is, market. Yeah. Uh, and you got that job because you have worked for everything that you've got. Mm -hmm. And you had all of these internships with some pretty big, well-known papers. 
and walked in there and from an internship, that's what you, you, you got a job in Raleigh. Yeah, I mean, it's unfortunate because I think um, a lot of times when you're black and definitely when you're a black woman and you get in these traditionally white media spaces, uh, they say it and sometimes they don't say it. They at least insinuate it that you're only there to fill a quota or you're there because of affirmative action, not because you're actually good. And I would put my journalism resume, I take the Pepsi challenge against anybody, okay, <laughs> because of the things that I've done. And so, you know, to come out of college with five internships put me on a course to be successful in this business. And that's something that I understood from the beginning, which is why I was so driven um, and had a lot of ambition to make that happen. Yeah. You had a lot of ambition despite how you grew up with a mother who was, you know, used crack and heroin and all of these other drugs. And you even mentioned that some of her um, people that sold her drugs, they could see that she was different, that she had more potential. They still sold the drugs, mm -hmm. but you had a life where you read, you, you wrote in a journal, you, um, you were well, you were worldly for, you know, the situation that you would, one would maybe think, you know, that you have a mom who had going through all of these challenges. And that also helped to shape who you were and even some of the men in your mom's life. You talked about, uh, I think, your stepdad who was into sports, who, mm -hmm. you know, and, and how he would read to you. Yeah. Uh, talk about how that has shaped your journalism career too. And so even I grew up in a dynamic with a lot of very adult problems, um, there was still a standard being set all the time. And this is what makes sometimes families so complicated that people can be going through some very traumatic, very severe things, but yet still at the same time tell you how to do the right thing and make sure you do, do the right it. thing. And so despite the fact that I had a bunch of adults around me that were struggling with some personal demons, the expectation was that I still was to get good grades, go to school, take care of my business, be respectful, uh, be w well behaved and mannerable. That was still the standard and it didn't change. And so my mother, especially when it came to my writing and pursuing journalism, was my biggest champion uh, because she wanted, and I would say this for her, my, grandfather, my grandmother and my father as well, they wanted me to have a life that was better than theirs. And that was the general expectation. And so because of that, that's what I pursued. That's what I knew was in store for me. It's like, I, I see the, the mistakes and the decisions you all have made, and I want to do the opposite of, of what, what you, you have did. done. Mm -hmm. And they encouraged me to do that. Like, you know, that's why I named one of the chapters Drunk, Drug, or Indifferent. It's because my mother often preached to me that regardless of what shape I'm in, you're still going to school. Like, you can't use anything that's happening in this house as an excuse not to achieve. And mm -hmm. so I didn't know anything else but to navigate my life like that. And it's what shaped me going forward in the sense of, uh, yes, there will be personal struggles and issues that you have to deal with, but I'm not going to lean on any excuse for me not to have the life that I envision for myself. Yeah. What I would say to young people is, number one, to be gentle with themselves. Uh, you know, I, I noticed that young people put a lot of pressure on themselves these days. And the, the other thing I, I would say, especially those who are going through very tough circumstances, is that they have to believe they want better, mm -hmm. that they deserve better, not even just want, that they deserve better. And even in situations where you don't have people in your life, like I had, who will tell you that you deserve better, there's got to be something inside of you that knows this isn't it for you. And you have to pursue those things that you're passionate about, that um, you know make you happy, that make you excited about creating a future. Pursue those very single-mindedly and very purposely because you know whatever tough circumstances that you're in, you didn't do anything to create those circumstances. It doesn't make you less deserving. If anything, it should be what inspires you to change them, not just for yourself, but future generations to come in your own family. Mm -hmm. Did you always think that you would make it? Because it, it felt like when I was reading it, you know, there you were aware of what was going on, though when you were very young, you couldn't quite put your finger on it. Mm -hmm. And I love that you were calling out street names, you know, that you could remember, <laughs> you know, being over on Linwood and yeah. you seeing somebody with three fingers and yeah. two fingers at Joy that. Joy Road. All right, that Joy stuff. Road, right, right. Mm -hmm. that, that, was, that was great. But what are you, I, I don't know, how... Being raised here, I'm not from here. Mm -hmm. I have a three-year-old and I love this city. I've been here eight years and I'm just blown away when I meet people like you who have made it. You're so authentic in who you are 
and so many other people that I meet that are from here, I, I had to find that mm. when I became an adult. What part of South Carolina did you go to? A little small town called Newberry, but I'm a Newberry. graduate of okay. the University of South Carolina. Okay, I see what you see. But you grow up kind of like fearing uh, talking to adults, really saying what you really want to say. It feels like when I read the pages, it didn't feel like you ever thought that you wouldn't make it, that you wouldn't be where you are today. When I was young, I, I, I didn't, I didn't know that I could make it. Mm. Maybe because being in a black city, you saw people who looked like you, that made a difference. This woman who was over the internship, mm -hmm. she looked like you. Right. I didn't necessarily have that growing up in a little white town, a little yeah. small, you know what I mean? So maybe that was the difference, but what would you say to that? Do you think that you always felt like you were going to escape from that, those circumstances and? Yeah, I, I was pretty confident that I was going to, to make it. Now my version of making it then versus what it actually turned out to be <laughs> is way different. Like right. I never envisioned I would be a celebrity. I never thought I'd be at ESPN. I never thought I would one day host the 6 p.m. Sports Center. Like those things were not on my vision board. I thought I was I would make it if I just made fifty thousand dollars. I know a year. you said that. I used to think the same <laughs> it's thing. Like fifty grand. That was I don't know why that was such a specific total. number. Right, right. Yeah, it's a just specific a, yeah. number. Maybe because growing up I didn't know anybody that right, made fifty thousand right, dollars right, a year. Right. So it, I knew that I would be able to get out and change the circumstances, and I would live a different life. But it just turned out way better than I ever imagined. You know, I heard somebody else say this, say this and I wish I could uh, accurately quote who the author of this quote was, but it, the, the problem is not that our dreams are too high, it's that they're too low. Mm -hmm. And I realize now looking back that mine were actually too, too low, low. <laughs> right? That I should have been thinking about, you know, maybe having a very broad reaching career. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't have been able to predict um, some of the things that have happened to me but I mean, I definitely believe that I, I always knew that I was going to have changed circumstances, that I was going to break a lot of generational curses in, a, in yeah. our family. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's just fantastic. Um, in closing, what do you want people to take from the book? It, well, some of the biggest takeaways that I, I hope people have when they read it is one, your circumstances, no matter how bad, they don't have to dictate the life you feel like you deserve. They just don't. The other thing that I would say is that I think it's very important that we're vigilant about really researching our family histories, about understanding that our parents had dreams and goals and things they went through long before we ever popped up. And it's important that we ask them about those because it not only allows us to understand them better, it al It not only allows us to understand them better, it also allows us to give them more grace. Mm -hmm. And that grace is important. Mm -hmm.